Yeah. 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 All right, we've got uh, all right, we've got a quorum. So um, our public meeting is in session, and uh, I assume we're going to go into exact if we have a motion to do so. That would be great. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll be moving. Uh, I, I Second. Yeah, second. Then. Okay, we got a second. Okay, good. Very good. And so, Emily, please call the roll and we can uh, do this. Yes. 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 Kelly Evans. Elder Harris. Yes, ma'am. Nicole LaFave. Yes. Moira Lang. Yes. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Oh. Pat Wazalu. Yes. All right. So we're going to move into exec, and there's a link. Correct. And Emily's going to send it on. And I see uh, at least three board members, and the two here, uh, Eldred, will be joining us uh, in a minute online. And so we have a quorum, so that means we can continue. And there's no modifications to the agenda, we're not changing anything, correct? Right? Are we good? Uh, not changing anything for anyone, and so. I think we're, we, uh, so we're good to just go ahead and get started. And I think we have some students, uh, students from Bell Sherman, some others perhaps that want to uh, uh, speak to the board. We're going to do that first and we can go to public comment period and hear from students in the room. And uh, so I'm letting, uh, letting all that percolate while we do it electronically. And Jeff Tomasic and others, whenever you're ready, um, we're glad to uh, glad to hear. Okay, um, all right. Um, so uh, thank you so much for having us uh, join you at the start of the meeting. Um, I know uh, a lot of you folks, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jeff Tomasic and I have the honor and privilege of uh, being the principal at Bell Sherman Elementary School. The year has certainly presented some challenges, but it also has not stopped us uh, from finding joy uh, and having our students uh, take action uh, to make the school more inclusive for everyone. Uh, so I'm so excited to have three of our students uh, presenting uh, you a short presentation this evening. Um, and there's also um, um, some key staff members who have helped uh, create this environment at Bell Sherman where kids are uh, empowered to do what they need to do uh, to help make it a safe and affirming place for, for all our kids. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Miss Miranda Bianchi, uh, who is our school social worker intern. So take it away, Miranda. 
Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and I also wanted to thank the board for giving us this opportunity to present this amazing work that these students have been doing. Um, so my name is Miranda Bianchi. My pronouns are she and they, and I'm the social work intern at Bell Sherman. I'm currently pursuing my master's in social work at SUNY Binghamton. And I've had the privilege of working with our peer educators who are um, these amazing, passionate, empathetic youth activists in fifth grade since September of the beginning of this year. Um, and so tonight we have three of them that are representing many more students who have been working on these projects. Um, and I wanna stop talking because we'd rather listen to all of them. So I'm gonna turn it over to my friend Chantal. Uh, hi, my name is Chantal Schwam Pomeroy. My pronouns are he, they. Um, so this group all started one day, we were doing introductions and one of us asked, what are your pronouns? We found out that nearly half the class doesn't use their birth pronouns and they don't identify as boy or girl. Um, and then our group started and we began to meet and each week we would talk and plan. We talked about gender and pronouns and all of that type of stuff. Our group is kind of just all about teaching people about <laughs> like just gender and all of that type of stuff and the importance of not just saying, oh, that person is a girl or oh, that person is a boy upon sight of someone and instead just asking them. Um, so if you're nervous about misgendering someone or using the incorrect pronouns, you can just use they, them. Um, so yeah, uh, Theo, you can do your stuff about, yeah. Thanks, Chantal. Um, hi, my name is Theo and I am gender fluid. And our only choice was to make the upstairs bathroom gender inclusive because it was the only way to make everybody feel included and comfortable. I think if you don't identify as a certain gender, you can use the gender inclusive bathrooms because it's for all genders. But I think the kids who are, who are using the stop and go signs are doing pretty good, but sometimes you have to knock just to make sure. It was so cool to make the new signs because it made all of us feel included. Now I'm gonna hand this um, microphone over to Ayana. Um, hello, I'm Iona. I use he, she pronouns. And the peer educators are going to brainstorm, brainstorm with some teachers and staff about the girl, boy and girl signs that are engraved for um, engraved outside of the built school building. Um, because we and we want to take it down because we want to make things a little bit more um like gender neutral. And what the peer educators are going to do next is um, the peer educators will start by um, going to different classrooms and well, in presenting our other slideshow on, yeah. So the peer educators will give a presentation on gender identity in all fifth grade classrooms. And all the fifth graders will be able to join the peer educators if they're interested. And then the peer educators will be able to adapt their presentation to make it more age appropriate for other grades and younger. Then we'll present it to the whole school. So. Yeah, and that was my part. So we know you have a lot on the agenda this evening and we wanted to save just a, a few minutes for any questions you might have. Um, we also have a couple other educators joining us this evening. Uh, our school social worker, Alex Scher and uh, classroom teacher, Ashley Palangeli. Uh, but uh, the, the students would be uh, super excited to answer any questions you might have at this time. So I have one question, well, I, probably a couple of questions. Um, one is, has, has something changed with bathroom assignments or are you proposing a change? I'm a little unclear on that. Um, well, we're more of like, 
So we really want a new change in the school, like a change for uh, some children that feel as if they have, they're not like, they don't use the pronouns that they were assigned at birth. Like for me, I feel that way. And for me and some other kids that they can relate, they have had trouble like figuring out where to use the bathroom or like anything like that. I had trouble with that too. I'm wondering if to, to further answer that question, if Iona or one of the other two students wants to talk about uh, the initial change that you worked on with uh, Mr. Alex and Miss Ashley this fall. So, um, oh, sorry, Chantal, were, were you going to say something? Oh, okay. So, um, I didn't really understand that question very much, but I did want to answer it. So, like, I didn't, like, really understand how, how that was worded, but, um, so yeah. I just so do, do you have do you have non-binary bathrooms at Bill Sherman now? Um yes. So we made them gender neutral or gender inclusive um because we wanted everyone to feel like safe because I know like me when I went into the boys bathroom I didn't feel very um like comfortable cuz I didn't like how I was supposed to go into that certain bathroom. But before that, we did have a gender neutral bathroom, but um, it was downstairs and it wasn't upstairs because we are in the upstairs classroom, so we couldn't really go down there. Yeah, um, there's like, so we made the bathrooms up near the fifth grade classrooms um, gender neutral, so like boys and girls can use it. Some people aren't comfortable using the like, um, old opposite gender bathrooms, but that's okay, they can do that. Um, but yeah, so all the, most of the other, well, most of the other bathrooms in the school are still all just boy and girl and stuff. And I sometimes, I, I just always still use um, the girls bathroom, even though I don't really identify as a girl as, any, as a girl anymore, because I kind of feel like um people will just tell me that oh you're a girl you have to go in the girls bathroom and stuff and it would kind of make me uncomfortable so that's that's why I feel like we should try and change the other bathrooms to just be gender neutral yeah and like I know there may be some people that don't feel comfortable using the gender neutral bathrooms like um for some people, they wouldn't feel comfortable of going, like after COVID, people might not feel comfortable with going into a bathroom with like a different gender as them. Like they may not feel very safe. So like, we're gonna, we're gonna try to make things a little bit more uh, comfortable for everybody else if some people don't feel safer, comfortable in the gender neutral bathrooms after COVID. I don't have a question, but I <clears throat> want to thank you all for presenting to us today, as well as being so courageous and brave and honoring who you are and who you want to be, and also thinking about your peers and what makes everyone feel safe. So thinking about inclusion, which ICSD is always pushing for and love, meaning accepting people for who they are and who they wanna be. So I just wanna thank you all for pushing for those changes and being brave because it's really hard even when you're an adult, let alone when you are a child. So I appreciate each of you. Um. So uh, I knew about uh, the changes that you initiated a couple of months ago, because I was visiting at Bell Sherman and Mr. Tomasek uh, told me about what was going on. Uh, he was very excited and I was very excited. Um, it was, uh, Iona mentioned that one of the things that you're looking to see if you can make changes uh, in are the um, engraved boys and girls signs on the outside of the building. Some people may not be familiar with the gen 
the Bell Sherman building. Uh, but on one side of the building, there are two entrances and it goes back to when the building was built and maybe somebody can tell me what year that was, but uh, there was an entrance that was labeled and it's engraved in, in stone, boys and girls. So- uh, Literally etched in stone. Etched in stone. Um, and I've, I've wondered about uh, you know, the history of that and, and what you could find out about why it was that way. And then also I'm curious about what you're talking about, about how that might be changed. Go deep. Yeah, so I don't really know how that would be changed because like they're very obviously engraved. So, um, like, we're not quite sure how it could be changed, but like, first we could try at least uh, making a giant sign or like paper sign or like a banner that would say, that would cover it up or just take it down. I don't quite know. I will say our fourth graders are uh, diving into this topic uh, almost as we speak. So we, we have some amazing fifth graders presenting this evening. Um, and actually I'm meeting with uh, Mr. Bryman uh, and Ms. Verba tomorrow just to, to talk a little bit about some uh, preliminary ideas that uh, the fourth graders have come up with. So uh, uh, more to come um, regarding that. Um, I just like to jump in as as a one of the historians here to say that that was a commonplace uh, architectural feature of late 19th and early 20th century um, uh, school buildings. If anyone ever drives by the Whitney Point High School, the boys and girls sides are displayed prominently. It's a historical relic. I'm assuming, Mr. Tomasic, that you no longer uh, practice sending students uh, into those uh, 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 doors uh, by uh, nominal gender um, and probably never have. Um, um, that might be a question for the facilities committee about, I mean, this is, this is, I'm not sure how old the original Bell Sherman building is, but I'm actually surprised that it was it is that old that um, that that still have have been practiced. I basically thought that any of the school buildings that still had that I feature were, have been turned into condos by now. Uh, we're talking 1922, and I think. Okay, thank you, Rob. That yep that that would be so. That is a historical relic, and. Um, one might have to talk to facilities about filling in the words, oh, yeah. sandblasting. It's certainly not anything that has been practiced in any of the lifetimes of anyone on um, the board or the administration. Well, thanks, Pat. Since I know the chair of the facilities committee, we'll, we'll get on that. But Theo, I think, uh, Theo, go ahead. Um, so I wanted to add on to what Iona was saying. Um, so I, I have one idea, it just might, it, like, we're probably, it will take a lot to do this, but like, maybe like we could try some, like somehow like get pavement and we can like put pavement over the, the, the lettering. So it looks like it's just like, like it was just plain because we can put pavement over it because that's pavement, right? Is that pavement? Like how it's engraved? I think you're going to oh. concrete, but yeah. Oh, well, yeah, but we can, like, somehow, like, cover it up with, like, some, like, is it, con yeah, concrete? Concrete. Can, like, yeah. somehow cover, cover it up and, like, let it dry, and then it'll be, like, all covered. You know, I think the amazing thing about having this on a facilities committee agenda is that we can be extremely innovative in how we approach it, and similar to what Dr. Wazlu said, the exact same thing happens on other school buildings within the Ithaca City School District, some that no longer exist, like the DeWitt Mall, you will find the exact same thing built within the same 10 year period. So without question, something that we will explore uh, 
not explore, that we will find a solution to fix and change and to be much more affirming. Um, I will also say thank you for your uh, talk with us this evening. This is an issue that has great relevance to me um, and the work that I do and try to do at Ithaca College of having conversations about how do we get away from the gender binary. Um, personally, I try not to use the language gender neutral um, because for me that seems to be dismissive, but much more gender inclusive. Or as my spouse says to me, why don't we just call them bathrooms? Right, and so maybe we have to think about some other ways to make this happen. But we will also take a look at signage. We will find the ways that are, um, again, the most welcoming, the most inclusive, the most affirming. Um, we've been having this conversation as a school district. It has not moved fast enough. I I will um, honor that. Uh, but I also want folks to know that we um, this is a conversation that we've been having. So, uh, Mr. Ainsley, I look forward to this being on one of our facility committee sometime in the near future. Thank you again, appreciate you all. Um, can I just say that the best signs I have seen in the entire uh, community on this issue are up in uh, College Town, that's a new College Town Bagels. Their restroom signs say whatever, just wash your hands twice. <laughs> there we go, Lee. so we'll, uh, any, well, here we go, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, um, I want to say I I don't really have any you know questions about this, but um, this is a really a really great thing that you're doing. And I feel like very often there's kind of the perception that any kind of self realizations about gender or sexuality happen uh, at the at the earliest you know in, in early high school, and, you know, not until the end of high school. When in reality, you know, these are happening throughout anyone's life at any point, regardless. Um, so, you know, just a huge amount of respect to you all for bringing this up and taking action to, to do it yourselves um, at your school. So, a lot of respect. Uh, I'd like to echo Andrew's sentiments on that. Uh, I think what you're doing is amazing. Uh, I love how openly and confidently you all talk about this subject. I think it's, I think that's kind of a testament about how it's really never too early to start learning about these things and start talking about these things and really kind of breaking down these uh, oppressive systems that have been built up over hundreds of years. Um, and I would also uh, like to say that um, uh, I'm really, really glad that there are now uh, neutral bathrooms in uh, some of our elementary schools. And we are also pushing for there to be more um, gender inclusive bathrooms at the high school. Uh, there have been a few um, created in corners over the last few years, but um, we're also pushing for, for more of them as well. So. Really, really kudos to you guys. Yeah, and um, I went to Bob Sherman. I was in Miss Ashley's class, and I mean, that school did me very well. And I felt very accepted there. And so for more students to feel that way and being able to kind of grow and be able to have a school represent the people that go there is incredible. Excellent. Anyone else other than thumbs up? Great job, folks. Um, um so about like that sign that said like whatever wash your hands um i think um is it like the i forgot the name but um i know another restaurant it might be the same restaurant but our friends own it like um some of my friends um their mom and dad um own it i think yeah they own it um their names I forgot their names but I know that um but yeah they own it I think and so yeah I just wanted to say that again the restaurant specifically uh Theo is um College Town Bagels up in College Town they moved to a new location inside of one of Cornell's dorms actually looks like the Bat Cave so you might find it pretty cool but yeah, I thought those signs just got to the heart of it. Just stop playing games, whatever. People are fluid. Just wash your hands. Thanks, Elder. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, everybody. And I, Iona and Chantal, everyone. And, and Mr. Tomasic, you too, right? And uh, anything else, Jeff? Are we good? Excellent. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Sherman. Thank you guys. Thank you.
Um, can we stop now? I mean, it's, uh, do we have to do the drill? Okay. Um, Emily, do we have any public comments uh, in the works there somewhere? I think we've had a nice interaction so far. Um, it's almost Christmas. We don't need to, uh, any, we'd be glad to hear from anyone uh, if they wish to speak. But that lets us go right to student reps. And since I have semi left handed, I always like to start with LACS. So uh, go ahead. All right. Well, um, we have uh, a lot of, well, not a lot, of, a couple of updates. Um, first off, we are going to be having our winter solstice, uh, so our solstice day, which is going to be the 23rd. Yeah. 23rd. Um, and it's going to be a kind of an afternoon event, um, and we're going to have, have a, a kind of a family group lunch, uh, which is just kind of a small group of like a dozen students and a teacher, um, which is a, a recurring thing throughout the year. And so we're going to have a lunch in that uh, group, and then it is going to be some kind of open time with, with activities and just for kind of school bonding. So winter solstice day, solstice lunch has been a long running tradition since the school has been founded. Um, it's nice, it's, it's on the solstice. It's not, you know, affiliated with any, you know, specific religion or belief system. It's just, you know, it's a solstice, it's a, it's a human holiday, which is a, a word that we use. Um, and it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a tradition that we've very tried very hard to keep alive. And it's along with our various other traditions, it's a good way of making sure that, you know, students in the school have a community that they can fall back on and do what they know. Uh, and then we also recently, our most recent event was on our graffiti room. Uh, it's a place where students do public art and can express themselves and live in graffiti in other parts of the building. And they recently, it's been transferred in the ownership kind of was under our custodial staff and mildly our art teacher. And recently it's become a group of students, kind of a committee of sorts, or an actual, yeah, <laughs> an actual committee of students that now will kind of facilitate the room and decide when it's being like, painted over and what's deemed. LACS just got uh, the learning lab program under our a grant that now they can work on our building. There's an after school system that will help students kind of prepare for life after this, they're done with their education here. And we're really excited for that system to start. And it will probably build, I mean, it will benefit a lot of students. So we're really happy to have it. And then we have a theater production, which is. That's true. Um, we have. This one's been taking a little bit to get off the ground, um, especially because our so historically our theater our theater company has been run entirely by students. Um, because of COVID, we um, kind of the, the 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 knowledge of how to make production was kind of passed on, you know, for, for generations of, of, of juniors and seniors. Um, because of COVID, it kind of it it it, it broke the line. Um, so we've had some difficulty starting that up. We've had some excellent help. From you know, from Nettie Simpson, as well as a few other people who I'm uh, the names of. But our first production is going to be uh, Little Shop of Horrors, which is going to happen during February, um, which is a fun little musical if you're not familiar with it um, about a killer plant. And then there's going to be my understanding is there's going to be a Shakespeare show during the kind of late spring towards the end of the school year. Um, so that's happening. There's a, I, you know, there's a lot of you know, sixth graders and younger students getting involved with that, which is really good to see a lot of kind of new talent in the um, in the group, which is always um, always nice. So that's going to be happening mid February, and then Shakespeare play is going to be happening. That is our Alex accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Did we go on, please? Um, so December is quite a busy month for IHS students. Um, the IHS Orchestras had their first in-person concert with crowds for the pandemic began this past Wednesday. It was great success. It was amazing to perform in front of the crowd again. 
Um, the bands have their winter concert tomorrow, and the Pirates have their next Tuesday. Um, our meetings uh, with Mr. Trumbull are also going well, and we are currently discussing uh, and helping plan possible schedule changes for next year. Um, in addition, uh, the seniors of IHS who submitted early to student applicants hear back from the colleges this week, um, including Cadet, who's a brand new MFT of the Cornell class of 2026. Um, uh, as such, I just threw on uh, increasing tents recently, uh, but hopefully that will be dispelled soon. As many seniors will have their post high school plans finalized, or at least we don't have the hard part of writing their application. Um, students are also noticing that custodians and bus drivers are stretched in throughout the district. I would like to know if there has been any progress in shoring up, in shoring up staff shortages. Um, as Eric pointed out, our seniors are also getting back from their early decision colleges to home colleges. And as a result, this semester is an especially stressful time for upperclassmen given the demands that the, app that the application process still presents. Um, as a result of these college decisions, mental health among seniors is especially low. Um, mental health among high school students is also low. Throughout the school, as a result of neighboring schools closing and rising COVID cases throughout the district and, 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 and the entire school. Um, so this morning, um, the high school students, I received an email from Dr. Brown um, informing them that there would be, they would be no longer getting COVID updates uh, every time there was a positive case at the high school. On the same email was sent out to parents, uh, I think, the night before. Um, instead, a link uh, to the New York State COVID report card will be sent out weekly, and cases will be updated onto the ICC website uh, also weekly. Um, the email stated that this change was for the purpose of uh, streamlining communications, um, but the other student reps and I believe that this will back them to hear COVID communication throughout the district. Um, COVID case numbers and related information need to be as accessible as possible, um, especially with the rise of cases in Hopkins County and the closure of schools. Uh, districts nearby like um, Lansing and Dryden. Um, emails uh, where the new cases were easily visible were extremely helpful for both students and families. And streamlining, um, to my understanding, is making something more efficient, um, but changing the system um, of updating students and families is just adding another hurdle um, to access this vital information. Um, it also feels like during this time of unease, um, especially with the rising cases, um, there's kind of like a lack of transparency about cases that um, can be seen, so yeah. Like Aton said, as we all know, COVID cases are rising rapidly and Cornell shuts down with over 500 positive cases, almost 800 cases in Hopkins County, um, Lansing High School shutting down. Um, we have also noticed a significant rise in COVID cases at school as well. Um, students are worried that we will have to go back online and are concerned over what we perceive as lax policies for contact tracing. We have a couple of questions that would give students anxiety. Um, first, what is the protocol or plan for going back online? Um, would there be like a certain threshold for the number of positive cases? Um, what are we doing to prepare for a worst case scenario, a transition to online learning? Uh, we were also notified that surveillance testing has stopped. Uh, how are we getting back on track with this? Uh, we know that it's incredibly difficult to plan for scenarios that may be out of our control, such as a forced home closure due to rising COVID cases. But we'd like to emphasize how important we feel it is to be well prepared for any possibility. Um, also, considering that this situation is now not unprecedented, in order to avoid passing cases, make sure that I think is able to operate the best and be under challenging circumstances we must plan ahead. And Dr. Brown, I'm sure you're probably going to address the digital attendance business, et cetera. Oh, or, sure. we have yeah. So we'll uh, we're going to address all your questions and Terry Burke is sitting behind you. Um, so we'll uh, so let's get to all that um, shortly. But uh, board responses at this point from anyone about anything? Andrew, you want to? Oh, yeah. Andrew's going to respond. So um, <laughs> there, there you go. I just want to say, you know, on behalf of the three of us um, at LICS, we agree fully with everything that you guys just said. So. Um, 
And I'm sure it's much harder to get into Cornell than it was when I got in. <laughs> um, but that was a long time. But congratulations. Thank you. It is much harder. Nathan, we'll just, uh, might as well, uh, uh, if, uh, if we could just, uh, I think it's important to address all this in detail, right? So responses, if we can just get to the consent agenda, because while I have a form, so we get this voted on, personnel report, et cetera, to hire another custodian or two and things like that, uh, Bob, I think, and uh, another bus driver, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so let's just, it's not a long consent, and then we can go right to uh, 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 answering questions about stuff. I'll move the consent agenda. I'll second. Thanks, Pat. Um, and it's all been a uh, review, approved, uh, viewed by folks. Um, so, any questions? Chris, uh, I guess Chris, you're still there. Chris, everything's fine, right? As far as finance, right? It's pretty. Uh, there's the only thing that's really on there is the special aid funds for Tompkins Community Action for Head Start. Um, you know, just moving funds around for teachers' assistance and supports. Uh, but it's really uh, not a lot to this consent. Yep, boilerplate. Okay. Uh, who seconded Emily if we could do the roll and then we'll move on. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Sean uh, Bradwell? Yes. Aaron Croyle? Yes. Elder Harris? Yes. Nicole LaFave? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Wasley. Yes. Very good. Thanks. We, uh, we have plenty of quorum. And so, Dr. Brown, Superintendent, report, announcements, et cetera. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Street. And I'm going to invite Ms. Burke up to the table. Um, and as she comes up, I'll uh, do some initial framing. Um, and then we attend and intend to talk about COVID protocols and some transitions tonight, anyway. So, thank you all for your questions and for your feedback. We've gotten a lot of feedback. And I will note, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to answering the questions for the folks in the room and our young people. And I'm currently getting questions from folks on CNN and MSNBC because I guess other organizations are making decisions that are, <laughs> that are being communicated and folks are having questions about what we're doing here. So I, and the decisions we're making, the shifts we're making, have been informed by a lot of feedback. And frankly, the folks making the decision, myself, Ms. Berba, and others, are doing this 24-7, seven days a week. So much of what we've decided isn't just something we decided without a lot of thinking and without a lot of feedback. There's a, there's a need to share information, and then there's a need to share information and ask for some actions. What we've learned over the last couple of weeks, and this has been informed by a significant amount of feedback, every time we send a letter, which is often, about a positive case, we then need to follow it up. Your child, your family may be a close contact, then we need to follow it up with another letter saying we need you to do something. What we have learned is that the significant amount of information coming out is causing such significant confusions that families are turning off completely. They want to hear from us when they need to take an action. That is consistent with traditional approaches of communication that we've taken anyways, and we've heard that feedback loud and clear. So when I said is we were doing what we were doing to streamline communications, it is for just that. We are streamlining it for the families who have demanded we do so, and so that we can get quick reactions and action from families that we are attempting to do contact tracing and other things. Yes, we, we serve, use the term transparency. I, from my perspective, we have done a lot. That has been some of the feedback. You've been too transparent. You've given us too, too much information. Yet we're losing it. There are federal and state requirements as far as our transparency. So we are posting the information that we are required to post in an online portal, accessible to everyone. So if there are additional ways to be more transparent, please share with us. But I got to tell you, the decision around how often we communicate, one, I, 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 did, I talked to a lot of folks in our region and around the state. We're one of the few districts that send out those letters as much. I think we're the only one. 
everyone else long ago people were deciding to do it only once a week or sending folks to the portal we were the ones who were saying we're going to do this often and you know is it a lesson learned maybe we could have continued to do that before we got into the kind of double digit case count that we're now experiencing so please know without a significant amount of thought that kind of a transition wasn't something that we just decided all of a sudden but we were getting so much feedback from families that we had to do something different and that's what we decided to do it's very good about left and, and surveillance testing yes i think we saw the earlier communication about the company we were working with pausing on that implementation that's back up and running and we have started that as of today right or tomorrow it'll be this week yeah this week we're uh, finalizing the logistics getting it back going mm -hmm. this week yeah. all right I'm, i probably took too much no. any other things i leave out here i was wondering dr brown would you mind me sharing an example around communication please really, yeah. okay so for example i'm a parent in the district of two students one at the elementary one at the secondary level and so when there's a case in a building parents in U.S. secondary students um, parents in particular were getting an email and a robocall well as we've as the health departments become incredibly busy they've given us some latitude around confirming vaccination status for students and confirming that they are symptom free because when we can do that kids can come to school the next day but imagine you're a parent with kids in multiple buildings and there are cases in those buildings and your child's close contact. So you may be getting as many as two, three, four, potentially robocalls and emails and that uh, notifying you about the case. And then another one saying, hey, we understand that your child's vaccinated. Can you just confirm their symptom three? Can you screen them for the symptoms so they can come to school tomorrow? Or we understand that your child is not vaccinated or we don't have record of it. Can you share? A screenshot and Excelsior cast and confirm that they are symptom free so they can return. So the efforts that we're making around communication are designed to uh, enable parents to respond and take action and also to have students return to school the next day. Because originally the health department was the one to do that work, to follow up with individuals to confirm that they are fully vaccinated and that they are symptom free. But based on where we are uh, in, in our current situation, we adopted to, to take on those responsibilities in order to Again, uh, um, avoid uh, breakages in instruction, et cetera. Um, why can't we send out like a weekly email or roll call to notify families of cases that we? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you say that. Why can't we send out like a weekly email or roll call to notify families of cases that we? We certainly can look to do that, but again, we're 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 constantly looking to be responsive to whatever the needs are. And so if that's something that we find that people are looking, they're having trouble finding it on the website, they're having trouble finding the uh, New York State portal, we can certainly look to do that. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that if people are looking for, I mean, the, the way we have been doing it is, you know, a robocall plus email to the Google plus like an email blast to everyone. And it, you know, it does seem like a lot of, of communication. I feel like cutting off the flow of communication, uh, communication completely um, might be a bit of an extreme step. Uh, maybe some kind of a middle ground where there is some kind of communication, you know, maybe a weekly communication or maybe a, a, a bi weekly communication, something like that. Um, but not no communication unless you need to do something. Uh, but then again, I also don't know what exactly you were saying. So I could be on the line. I would agree with you. I think, I think that we are at a point of our ability to severe enough for us not to get notified whatsoever. I think it makes sense to at least have some sort of verification because it's still, I think, serious enough for if a student has a case of the building, like people should. So I think it makes sense to send out at least some sort of notification. I understand the excessive is, okay. but I do think that there's a clarifying question. The, the website is being updated. Yeah. There is a website that has all the information by school. So we could simply send a uh, communication out asking folks to check this website for your school information. Is that the kind of inf I'm hearing an ask for information, and that information is available daily. So if folks need an alert or a reminder to go check out the information, that is something we can handle by sending a link. But please be clear, we are, as a team managing this, we have to communicate to get some action immediately. 
And that communication stream is something that's a bit different from what I think I'm hearing from you all. So you're uh, just questioning, or so you're looking for a numeric, uh, okay, there are 15 cases that at the guy this, this week. This past week, there were 15 cases, but you weren't contacted. So, so I, so is that helpful or is? I think it definitely is. Um, I think that one thing, um, especially that we kind of want to try to understand more is also how much of what the, the general trends around us are reflected in IHS as well. When we see cases rising and falling in our community, nationwide, whatever it makes for now, for example, we want to know if IHS is being affected in the same way. Um, we, you know, if we, we see Cornell cases rising rapidly, and we want to know is IHS, you know, are there more cases in IHS right now? Do I need to like now be extra, extra, extra safe? Um, you know, all of us already wear our masks daily, try to minimize contact with other people, but we're still in a school with 400, 1400 kids. Um, and uh, I think that knowing where we stand on that um, is really helpful both for students' psyche and also for just kids like continuing to be safe. Um, just along the line of you know what what is the trend in our schools? Uh, Grace mentioned that uh, she believed that there were significant rising cases in Ithaca High School. Now I get all the same emails that people have been getting. I haven't seen that. So. What is the, the status, say, at Ithaca High School? Um, so, right, it's on a need to know basis, right? If you've like been in the vicinity of this person or something like that at this point in time, right? Um, yeah, because I've heard this from like going throughout the hall with Jack Marcy or whatever. That, like, if you've been like in contact with this person for more than like three minutes or whatever, then you get like an email, then you get like all of these protocols, then you have to go get tested if this, that, and the third. Correct. Yeah, the communications are designed, as we we're talking about streamlining, to focus on those who are identified as close contacts and to, to prompt them to respond, to provide information, to test to being symptom free, et cetera. And to, and to enable them to make decisions about whether they want to go and get tested. And lawyer, we have not seen a cluster or some kind of outbreak yet in the right. high school or any other school. Right. I mean, I mean no. my, the emails I'm getting is like one case here, one case right. there. The last I saw at Ithaca High School, maybe in the past week, had three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, so that's it's not a significant problem. No different from early in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I, re I really like the idea of just like having that thing as accessible as possible. I understand, obviously, hearing about the robocalls. Like, I think my mom gets uh, two robocalls from two different schools. So that is something. Um, that I totally feel is excessive. Um, and maybe if that link could just be sent out, if it's updated, is there any way for it to be updated like more frequently or weekly? Because I know, I, I don't know, to me that just seems like a longer period of time. Um, and we can also, uh, soon as I can with our administration, but we have this feature on Canvas, um, the, well, I don't know, like announcements, we can put an announcement. We can do something to alert. I don't know where the website alert and the screen. The, the link to that we're referring to is the state website. Is so, oh, yes, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so and like right now it took me like multiple Google searches to find it. Um, so yeah. I, I, I'm glad that it'll be made. And in addition to data on um, cases, it includes data on testing, both screening awesome. and symptomatic. So all of the information, it actually includes more information than what our, what our correspondents do. And Emily, uh, oh, uh, Nicole, Sean, uh, folks online, I, well, I can't see you anymore, but uh, oh, if you're still there. Yeah, they are. Nicole, Sean, questions, comments, Ted? Dr. Risley Bright, well, you had your hand up first. I can go after you. Yeah, I just want to um, reinforce what I understand the recommendation would be from our students is to have access to information. And so uh, that transparency can be dealt with 
on a number of occasions. And I can tell you as a caregiver who receives regular notices of positive cases in our school building, um, but doesn't require me any action is something that I've had to work through. And then at the same time, when there was a case of me having to take some action because of an additional situation, it still took four days for me to be contact traced. And so from the state, right? And so in some regards, what we are doing as a school district is actually far more um, proactive than what the process has been statewide because you will get contacted usually from someone within the, the school district. So the process is um, messy at best. Uh, I wanna remind folks that again, we're, we're in a pandemic. And I can also say that at no point in time do I as a faculty member get informed about students who may be have tested positive within my classroom. I may see the dashboard, but I don't get information about particular students as well. So there's a lot of work here to work through when I, but I say all that and this is to say, what I hear is that what we want is information. And I'm sure we can find ways to make sure that information is available. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be an email or a robocall every time there is a positive case at a building that may not impact my child. Go ahead, Nicole. I was literally just gonna say the same thing that Dr. Eversley Bradwell shared. Um, as someone who has three children in the school district, um, two in one building and one in another building, and as a board member, I get several emails about the same issue. And I will say that those emails, A, cause me anxiety, and B, sometimes get lost in the shuffle of work and personal emails. And in the instance when my kids had been in contact with someone who had tested positive, I had deleted the emails because I had just gotten to the practice of being emailed so many times that it was hard for me to even decipher between when it was impacting my child and when it wasn't. So I personally appreciate the streamlined um, process. However, I understand that people have different modes and needs for communication. Some folks like to be over communicated with while some folks only want to know when they need action. So I can appreciate us needing to find a middle ground. I think the, the resources are available. Um, however, how we disseminate and how often we disseminate that information, I think we can have more conversation about. For anyone listening at home or wondering, the link to that website is in the letter that we're referencing. So it doesn't require a Google search or anything like that in the letter you're reading about this, the link to their website. So, so I just like to add that um, while I was walking the tiny dog this evening before, um, before this meeting, I had a nice conversation with a neighbor who has a child in elementary school, a child in middle school, and a child at the high school. And um, her reaction was she just cannot take all, all the robocalls and emails anymore. Um, I understand that when you are a student at the high school, you may think, oh, well, if we get a number, there's 1,400 kids at the high school. But when you think, you know, the high school is really, really big. And if you say 15 cases or three cases, and then what you're really trying to do is figure out whether you can contact with one of those people and what you have to do, uh, you know, we cannot give you that level of granular information about someone else's health history. And when you get down to a school that has 200 kids or 300 kids, and there's, there's one case um, that, verges on um, you know identifying individuals and what their illness is and that is not something that we can really do so for to answer the question of being extra extra vigilant I would say from here on if you haven't been already there is not a day that you should not be extra extra vigilant I'm home tonight because I'm being extra extra vigilant instead of coming in like I plan to at 5 p.m. Um, 
we are we are in a very cr critical situation as a county. Um, it is my understanding it is largely confined to college students who do not have a lot of contact with um, school age students, but they certainly have contact with the community. And the best thing that you can do is remain mass, be vaccinated. And if you're old enough to get a booster shot, have your parents get you a booster shot. And there's, there's no way to make it better. Uh, Carrie, if you could just, uh, just give me a, give us, just a, going back to the testing and there were issues with companies, but well, just to clarify where we were on testing and what we were doing and what we are we're going to do, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. So we um, the lead agency that was uh, providing testing through federal funding in Health and Human Services decided to switch intermediaries. The intermediaries, the agency, in the previously was Affinity, now it's in a new company called Concentric. What they do is they manage logistics for testing, they ship us supplies, um, they operate the platform through which we register tests and through which reporting is conducted. And for whatever reason, which they didn't was close to us, they decided to move away from the Affinity vendor to this new vendor. And so we've been involved in onboarding processes and data validation processes. The good news is that anyone who's consented through the Thanksgiving break does not need to reconsent. Those have been uploaded into the portal. Um, the process remains the same in terms of what's involved with testing. We'll put two samples from each individual, one designed for pooled testing, and then the other designed for individual testing should the pool be positive. Um, we haven't heard any differences with respect to the reporting timeline. We're still anticipating it's gonna be 24 to 36 hours. Um, so really, uh, many of the mechanisms around testing haven't changed, but the, the players have in terms of this intermediary. Right, and when was testing interrupted? Testing was interrupted right before we returned from Thanksgiving break. So we tested through up through, I believe it was the 23rd, um, and then it was paused by the company right before we got back. Right, and so starting up later this week, this week. perhaps? Okay. Uh, in my reading, I, I came across, I thought that Infinity uh, went out of business, or they just don't do this. Right? They just don't do that. They, yeah, okay. uh, that's what I was uh, okay. informed of. Uh, I was wondering if that was the company that was uh, servicing us. So okay, very good. So, um, so we're going to start testing the end of this week, and testing will be available through next Thursday, right? And then we're off for winter break, and then we're going to be testing obviously all next semester. I mean, we're we'll be testing you definitely, yes. Right. Exactly. And uh, and when that provider um, decides not to do it, there will be a different one. So uh, there, will, there will have to be some some way to fill the void. So we'll continue testing. And uh, and Dr. Brown, we do, uh, you know, um, judging by the amount of uh, uh, cases that we have, and it's been proven over and over again that uh, where, uh, where folks are being exposed, frankly, it's not in schools, that is home, it is on the weekend, it is at a party, it is typically elsewhere. The best place to be, frankly, is in school. Um, and having a, maintaining that routine, and Dr. Brown, I certainly believe, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna count the days because the, the days slide by pretty quickly anyway, but uh, we will be in school until next Thursday. Yes, sir. And to note, the school districts in our area, in the region, in the state that have closed, it have not been because of an outbreak or a spreading of the virus. It has been because of operational concern and staffing issues. A shout out to staff in the school district. Their efforts and their commitment to be in person, to follow the protocols, is keeping this small city school district open, period. And we need to thank them every time we see them. We are here, we need to be here. There are families who depend on us to be open each day for a number of reasons, including teaching and learning. So it is our, it is our hope and <laughs> that we are staying open each and every day we can. And a shout out again to the folks, and a special shout out to Amanda Burke and Carrie Burke and the folks who are doing this through the weekends, into the night, and up first thing in the morning. It's like a perpetual snow day. And before the pandemic, I used to hate snow days. And it seems like we've been on a snow day for two years now, 
up all night to do on this work. So anyway, yeah, so we hope to be open all next week. We'll be open. Yeah. I keep talking about um take care. And uh Grace going to contingency plans. Sure. Hey, we uh we did uh we did remote learning, if you can call it that. It's a it's a failed system. Um uh, it's not something that uh we expect to do. Um, we we're certainly not going to do hybrid learning, um, but yeah, if, uh, if we have to, there will be there are organizational dy dy dynamics in place to uh, to go back to providing meals to folks that think are not going to get their meals unless they are in school. There are all those things that are in place to make that happen. Um, and yeah, if I could thank you for the question because yes, we have planned, we have done it. If needing to go remote overnight with a couple of days notice, we can do that. It's not ideal when we, whenever we do it, it's not the best scenario, but we have done it. We have plans to do so as well. Um, is there like a threshold of no. the expectations? No. Would it be a decision made by the district or would it be by the Well, there have to be, uh, I don't know, we've, uh, we have a new governor in the state. Uh, it would have to come from the state to, uh, if somebody's going to close down this district, it's going to have to come from either um, a governor or the president of the United States. Uh, we will, uh, uh, enough is enough. Um, we were, uh, we've been there, done that. Um, it is damaging in so many, many different ways, far exceeding uh, the, what we're doing as far as wearing a mask, et cetera. Um, so um, we, uh, we will never voluntarily, proactively say, well, geez, we just can't, we're Ithaca and we just can't do this. But we don't do that. We're not Lansing, we're not Dryden, we are Ithaca. And so we we are different. And so we will be here and uh, schools will be open when they should be open. If at some point uh, somebody says, okay, we're shutting down this whole world again, we're gonna shut down the economy. You can't go to work, you can't go to school. Um, they tried that. It, you know, just doesn't work. Just to confirm, if we end up in a situation where I just where ICSD is forced to shut down, which at this point does seem like it could happen, we are hitting a new high, all time high for cases in our area and in New York State. Um, we have the plan of supporting infrastructure in place for learning to move online in a much more efficient manner than it did in spring 2020 or even fall 2020. Yes, yes, we yeah. we've, we've transitioned to ball line before we can do that again. But to but Adam, to your point, uh, in a far better way, um, online sitting at a computer all day as a as a as an educated as an educator or as a, as a student is it's not uh, that's not that's no experience. That's I, not agree. I, I agree. It's, it's still I don't. You know, you can get it. Yeah. I have two big screens I look at all day. Uh, if I had to sit there, if that was my educational experience, that is that is a failure. Uh, I, I I agree with you, and I think what we're just trying to do is ensure that if we end up in that scenario, that we can make it the, the best it can be under those conditions. Adam, if I can jump in real quick. Um, sorry, Aaron, I see your hand, so let me let me stop for a second, and then I'll respond. Well, if you want to respond to Adam, and then I have several questions, so maybe it's best if you go first. Right. So I'll be quick. Right. We've watched what happened with Cornell today. We've experienced this at Ithaca College. We've experienced it with local school districts. Um, and Adam, I say this with great humility, no matter what our best plans are, there is no smooth transition to make this happen. It has a significant disruption to families. I'm one of those families that uh, changes my workday completely. Um, and there's many other families. And as an educator, uh, to ask me one day to plan to be in person and the next day to be virtual and try to make my lessons virtual, um, it, it's gonna, it's, it's messy at best. So I understand the, um, I very much appreciate asking us, you know, to make sure that we have plans in place and protocols in place, which we do. And it's still gonna be a difficult transition should that happen. Uh, the other, in terms of if we were to have to shut down, um, quote unquote, or go virtual, right? If we'd have to have virtual education, there are a number of scenarios that could possibly make that happen, all of which we hope do not take, take place. Um, but 
But I just want to make sure that we understand that it, it's a difficult transition, no matter what the best plans are. Um, so a, a couple questions to follow up here. So we're talking, I mean, I, I look at Lansing and I know we're not Lansing and we are Ithaca, but knowing their situation, I mean, they literally did not have enough staff because people are getting sick and that is why they shut, right? Um, and so that is something that's out of our control, right? If teachers get sick, if teachers test positive and we literally don't have enough staff, they're stretched thin as it is. So what do we do then if there just aren't enough people? Um, and so when we're talking about that and we're talking, so, so that's one question, what do we do if we just don't have enough people? When we're talking about the plans that have been mentioned, I mean, what I, I would love to hear a little bit more about plan, like, is there childcare? What about students with high needs who they cannot learn virtually? Do we have plans for that? And can we hear about that to ease the anxiety of families? Because it does feel inevitable that we might go virtual, maybe not permanently, but for, for a period, considering how much this is spreading, considering that Omicron is, is more transmissible and that COVID in general is airborne. And then my final question, considering that this virus is airborne, you know, I, I think that we should keep schools open. I think it is important. But what about the things that aren't as important, you know, we and especially those high risk extracurricular activities, you know, sports, even if you have a mask on, you're breathing, band concerts, choir concerts, we know that it can spread that way. We know that people don't always wear their masks over their face, they might pull it down to talk, they might pull it down to eat and drink, it is going to spread. So do we have a, what are our contingency plans and how are we going to handle those higher risk activities? Are we going to think about maybe scaling back a bit as our community sees this huge, dangerous surge? Thank you, Erin. I'll, I'll try to address all the questions that I think I heard in there. Um, and if I missed one, please share that question again and I'll try to answer. Uh, there are multiple contingency plans. Yet we also know that we would have to plan for something that we have never seen before. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. We do know that uh, what I would refer to as an operational close is if we don't have enough staff to man safely a building. We have not been in that place yet. And hopefully we won't get to that place. That operational closing could like an, look like an entire building closing or most of the building closing and maybe having some support and classes for the most vulnerable or certain populations of young people. We now, two years in, we've seen different school districts, not only in our state, but all over the country do different things based on the scenario they are in. So without knowing, it's hard to speak to a plan for a hypothetical, but without knowing exactly what we'd be dealing with, I can tell you that we will manage this to best meet student needs. But again, we are at right now open. Yes, we are monitoring the case counts because case counts are still important for us in schools because of the ways which we are at this moment required to quarantine and isolate folks who are testing positive. That may be different from other narratives we will start to hear about hospitalization rates and se severe illness. Until the protocols change for schools, we are monitoring the case counts, which can have a significant impact on staffing when it impacts bus drivers, teachers, administrators and others. Again, as the cases rise, if they continue to impact our staffing issues, we will make adjustments, knowing that the worst case scenario and last resort would be to close the building like we did in March 13, 20 and 20. Did I get all of your questions in there, Erin? Is there another one? No, and so I'm gonna go one at a time because um, I think this is important and I've had a couple people message me as we've been talking. So first question would be, um, are we gonna consider stopping extracurricular high, higher risk activities because this virus is airborne, such as sporting events, or are we gonna limit crowds at those events? Do we have any plans in place given the rampant spread? Because, okay, it's Cornell has 500 cases, but that still leaves hundreds more of cases that are community spread and, and many, many more that people aren't getting tested. So first question, higher risk extracurricular activities, 
Is, are we doing anything about that? Us as an individual school district, no. Right now, we're still playing. Uh, the, the conversations and emails that are going around with our section and other schools in our region right now. If the section and the local school districts who are participating and competing as part of the section make a determination to shut down high risk sports and others, we will do so. But at this, as of this moment, there are no plans to do that. So no limiting crowds, no limiting anything. Okay. Uh, Next we're question. Doing that before. We were already doing yeah. that. We do that already. And also the health department has the ability to, to roll back yeah. activities in the county. So some of those decisions might occur at the county level if they thought they saw clusters emanating from those extracurricular events. Every week when we meet with them, one of the things we ask is, should we be doing something different? When we meet with the health department, that is, sorry. We ask, should we be doing something that's different based on what you're seeing? Okay. I was at a basketball game the other night to the, to the young athletes who were wearing masks as they were playing. Uh, yeah. I would never wear a mask playing basketball. They were wearing masks. The uh, their, uh, folks were essentially getting checked into, uh, into the gymnasium. Uh, names are taken. And, you know, but attendance is being monitored uh, during the fall. Uh, there is limits on the number of attend soccer eventually that it was up a little bit as cases went down. So this is all being done with flexibility and the needs of the day and the needs of the students and the needs of the community. But uh, other? Yeah, just like, um, I don't know, um, LECS, I can't go to a, a IHS sports event. Right. Um, they are locked only um, right. IHS students. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Well, right, I mean, but that's, these are the steps that are being taken. Right. Sure. Okay. Thank you. That's useful. Um, my next question is, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. So, I mean, we, we're talking about, you know, case by case basis, school by school, but, you know, I, I have communications plans and all sorts of plans for the, for the work that I do. So when we talk about plans, I mean, knowing how widespread this is, are we looking to send Chromebooks home every night? Are we looking to be ready to go virtual so we don't have to like scurry like we did in March, 2020? I recognize that we don't anticipate shutting for the rest of the year, but we could shut for a week. We could shut for several days. So are there plans to help our staff and our students transition to that? in a way that would not be as stressful, both on our students and our staff. Um, and then I have, I have a follow-up after that. Yes. We've done this too. Um, we've sent Chromebooks home on a Friday evening when we have learned that we needed to shut down the building on a Monday morning. So we have protocols and plans to do this and we have done it with multiple schools over the past two years. Okay, because I, I, I have three kids in school and they've never been sent home with a Chromebook. So I'm asking, like, have, have we thought yeah. about just sending them home on a daily basis? Because we get the best results at night, right? We don't, you know, we don't know if the next day they should be in school or not. Things can change like that. So, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Agreed. You know, some Chromebooks aren't going home and that's been part of our instructional practices, practice. But if the Chromebooks are needed, to keep instruction going, we do have plans to do so. Okay, and then my my last question, my last specific question is, when we're talking about planning, right? Because I know that Lansing is providing childcare for ages K through six, since you know we're talking about parents who still have to work. So if we were to shut for three days or something, or one school were to shut for three days, do we have plans in place? to provide child care for children who can't be alone. So that would be, you know, younger children, but also students with disabilities who can't be alone. And then additionally, do we have plans in place to support students who are unable to learn virtually, who either need a one-on-one -on -one aid or, or, you know, get nothing out of communicating through a Chromebook? In recognition of the uh, significant inconveniences it causes when we shut down, and noting that as a school district, we do not and cannot offer child care at this time. That is different from other local school districts. And I was on a call today, and part of what's helping ease this inconvenience in other school districts is they're offering child care. Um, and they're a licensed child care provider to do so. We are not. 
So we do not have plans and cannot offer childcare. Again, reinforcing our need and sense of urgency around staying open. And Mary, you heard that, that second question was about yeah. one to one supports. Yeah. yeah, if I could speak a little bit to the virtual learning plans that are in place, should a student with an individual education plan need, need to go virtual, that they have those short term supports. So that that's a collaborative process. And right now we're encouraging families and caregivers to reach out to their case managers, the special education teacher, the educator for inclusion. If they have had to put that virtual learning plan in place and they wish to make an update, there's a piece of it that's not working. But those are, that's a collaborative, continual process. And you're absolutely right. Some students do not respond well to um, teletherapy or speech services, and it's not a helpful solution. So some of the other pieces have been, what are activities that can be sent home? Uh, as far as sending staff into homes for one-on-one -on -one support, that's not something that's part of the virtual learning plan. Very good. I'm yeah. so sorry. No, no, I just, I just have a follow up on that. I mean, if we were to have a school close for that, would could there be a way that those students, we could have those students with IEPs in classrooms in a way with supports? Like, is is there an idea to do that because they've been marginalized so greatly over the past year and a half? Like, I know. From my own personal experience, none, none of that works for my son. And I, I know of a number of students who also, that they, they get absolutely nothing from anything uh, unless they are with someone and, and in some cases in a classroom. So is that an option for those students who have suffered so greatly over the last couple of years? So I think, one, I, I want to acknowledge your question really highlights the importance and the gratitude I feel for our educators and all staff that are keeping our buildings open because closing them has significant impacts on our most vulnerable students. And so making a plan for how are we going to support students accessing education should we be in a non-in-person learning situation, we'll do what we did last time. We'll look at, at case by case, We'll do our best to assess the situation, work with our, our unions, what's possible, what, what's the reality and what's not. Um, and right now, I just want to express a tremendous amount of gratitude. I get to be in schools, and I am so grateful for all the staff that are keeping us open. Absolutely. Uh, how about one last question from anyone? But it would be. Rob, not a question, but a quick response. Um, I continue to realize that we're in a, again, a moment of great uncertainty. And yet at the same point in time, at the end of last week, when classes ended on both Cornell and IC campus, there was great concern about what was gonna take place over this weekend. And if you take a look on social media, there are a number of events of large gatherings of students who are not masked and so in some regards, some of this wasn't completely unexpected, even while we have a significant spread that's taking place. But there were conversations amongst faculty, there was conversations among staff, there was conversations among students who were trying to decide if they're going to go to a gathering or not. And so I say that in essence to say that this is not just something that's happened from nowhere. This happened, classes ended, people are exhausted, they wanted to get out, they did get out. And we are seeing the impact of then folks being at large gatherings with hundreds of people without masks on. And therefore we have, as people have said, right, super spreader events or super spreader parties that have taken place. So I just wanna make sure that we acknowledge that as well. We're not in the regular class period and this happened. It happened at the end of class when people wanted to get out and maybe not make all of the best decisions. And that's partly why we're seeing it on both college campuses. Thanks, Sean. And just one last thing, um, as students in the district, you know, we want we to, uh, completely want to stay in school. Um, we love school and we appreciate our teachers so much. Um, and, and the staff, and, like they, they keep us afloat. Um, but something that I've been thinking about is if there does happen to be um, a COVID outbreak at the school or among uh, teachers and staff, um, if we 
don't shut down. And that does lead to kind of operational, like you can't operate because we don't have enough staff or we don't have enough teachers. Um, wouldn't it, once before that outbreak happens or if there are signs that an outbreak will occur, isn't it, would it not be better to go online before more teachers, staff and students are put at risk um, so we can, we end up the same result, but fewer teachers end up with COVID and end uh, up sick. Uh, thank you. Um, please know, mitigating the spread and keeping people safe is what we think about all the time. So washing hands, mask, mask wearing, physical distancing, those are all layer protections that we're doing every single day. And yes, going online is yet another layer of protection. It's just further down on the continuum. So we hope that there will be never, there will never be an outbreak. And all things we're doing right now in this room, being hybrid, wearing masks, being physical distance, is leading to that. And if we needed to have everyone be completely virtual, we would do that too. We just don't have that place. So I hate to use colors. I know we're the little red. We're not in red. We are in a yellow, I guess. And hopefully, if we needed need to transition to a different stage, we would do that. But not right now. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all y'all's questions so much. I think, Dr. Brown, you anticipated talking about this tonight. So I think that's. I don't, I haven't known what it's like not to talk about it. Yeah, so uh, it was good to uh, put a review. And we're. Uh, we're uh, gonna just uh, roll through uh, roll through some policies, and we're not gonna do committee updates because we're gonna save that till January when we have something to update. I think we're, we're updated out for tonight. <laughs> um, and Sean, you wanna run through these policies, and so we can let folks uh, go on. And yeah, thanks, uh, Rob. I'm looking at board docs now, and I don't see the policies listed. Um, yeah. Maybe I'm at the wrong place. And so what I would recommend is that uh, we table uh, 11 point, I make a motion that we table 11.1 .1 and 11.2 until our next board meeting. Second. Second by Maura, since Maura is on the policy committee. Uh, well, we I know, also, I can't see know the, best. I, know I can't best. see the policies either, so <laughs> but I can't I was, exactly uh, read them. <laughs> Where I was, uh, I attended these policy committee meetings and, and I, I know them well, but uh, I think we're good. And so that was seconded and we have to, um, all right, we'll call the roll. And uh, unless there's some objection to a tabling, but you can vote against tabling, but go ahead. Bob Ainsley? Yes, table. Sean Arsley Bradwell? Yes. Aaron Croyle? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Nicole Faith? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Wasselin? I really wanted to go over them, but I'd be overruled anyway. So, yes. Really just trying to get through this policy book. We keep uh, hunting on these, but that's okay. Um, set of dates and legal notice for public hearing for district wide safety plan. Dan, do you want to just, we're going to insight, Dan, anything that you want to share? Go right. ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I had a presentation shared, but. Do you have like a PowerPoint that yes. we can look at and all that? I can send it to you guys. Okay. All right. Would that be? I was actually kidding, but uh, no, it's, uh, sure. All right. All right. Okay. So we, now we have to set, um, and we just have to set the date, which would be 30 days. Well, Dan, just to uh, we'll just bring folks up to speed and uh, board members to know, um, we're. Uh, 30 days from when, 30 days from you know, to when, so give us a Well, tonight I was, gonna, I was prepared to just uh, do a brief presentation. Okay. And then from the presentation, uh, uh, we, can set the, we can set it for 30 days. And our next board meeting in January is a little bit outside of the 30 day range. So that'd be a perfect date uh, to, have to schedule the public hearing. Yeah. But um, glad to, uh, Glad to have you 
give us an update on the safety plan. Okay, okay. Great. Yeah, we did away with policies. So we're not going to do more stuff now. Okay, so let's, cool. We need to get some uh, work done from you. I seem to have lost a little bit of an audience. Well, <laughs> students need to vote. They've been there right. for a while, so it's okay. okay. That's not me, no. That's all right. That. Well, thank you. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so, you know, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but, um, you know, the, the pandemic itself, is, it's created a lot of challenges, but it's also a time to examine and reimagine our safety plan. Um, you know, why we're doing this, we, we know how much it's impacting our students and everyone in unprecedented ways. And we don't want to recreate a plan that is uh, oppressive. So we know this is an opportunity to create a more inclusive plan. So some of the best practices in our plan, uh, and it's, it's written in here, our evacuation procedures, we have uh, written in all sorts of distancing that happens. Uh, when we do a lockdown um, because of COVID, uh, we don't need to hide. We don't need to hide in one area. We can, the teacher can provide an overview of the drill um, and talk through that. And then also uh, we added in the plan how important it is to communicate with families and how this can really help with planning and the um, uh, supporting social emotional health if kids know that these drills are occurring before that they, they happen. All right, so um, and over the last few years, we've, we've done some changing on when we contact law enforcement. Um, you know, one of the things we, we've added is a member check with the with uh, our superintendent or our deputy. Um, and if there's not an imminent danger or harm, um, you know, we don't, we don't have to call law enforcement. Uh, we can call uh, parents and caregivers or any other supports for the, the student in crisis or whatever the situation may need. Um, additionally, of course, if you're in a, a, a real emergency or you need an immediate response, uh, we want our principals and administrators uh, to take action accordingly. So, and some of the other things we've added, um, you know, in our, our uh, in the last few weeks, uh, especially learning from the event that happened in Heights, uh, a lot of our teachers used um, resources from the National Association of School Psychologists, and uh, one of the one of these items that's in the um, safety plan is uh, talking to children about violence. And, you know, we know how confused and frightened our children may feel. And this is really an opportunity to make them feel a sense of normalcy and uh, uh, a sense of security, as well as we know that uh, these drills um, can be hard for many of our students. So, um, yeah, uh, I added another resource for students with autism spectrum disorders and really looking at, um, you know, these drills can provide um, sensory disruption, uh, changes in routine, and we really, we really want to make these uh, drills uh, less anxiety provoking for our students. Um, one of the last things, the state uh, had a memo last year where they asked all the district uh, safety plans to include protocols for responding uh, to declared public health emergencies. And so we've added a section here um, as well. And it talks a lot about staggered work, work schedules. If, um, if there's a closure, um, who handles the PPE? Um, uh, also, what, what does the communication look like? Um, and we, we have a, a, a robust, robust section that answers all these questions. And then uh, last but not least, in some of our last meetings, and, and the events that we've gone through, I just wanted to kind of briefly go, go over, uh, you know, a few of our drills. You know, a lockdown drill um, really is, it's if it, if it's the, excuse me, <laughs> if there's an immediate threat of violence to the school, that's really when uh, the school should be secured. It can happen on the grounds um, or in the building, but that's when a school should go into a lockdown. It, it provides, a time barrier if there's an intruder in the building. Um, and then of course students um, are out of sight and are remaining silent. Shelter in place, 
uh, which is in the plan, of course. Uh, it's used when it's safer inside, and a lot of schools have used uh, these drills for weather situations, um, uh, tornadoes, or where, where it's where there's something happening outside where the, in, the interior of the building is better and safer for the students. Uh, for the lockout, this would be if um, to secure school buildings and grounds, if there's a concern outside of the building um, and um, that there, there's a lockout that happens. And the hold in place is, um, hold in place exists when there's something that's happening in the building, um, but it's it could be uh, a fight in the hallway, um, but it's, it's to keep students and staff away from an affected area in the building. And then last but not least, evacuation drill. Um, this, is, um, this is if it's safer outside of the building. Um, and this is also, uh, also known as our fire drills. Um, but we, um, uh, you know, we, we, they can be used for a variety of di different situations where students go to an evacuation site. All right. Um, that's about as fast as I can okay. get through a 90 page document. And, uh, so, yeah, yeah. No, we appreciate so, it. It's been gone over in detail. Uh, yeah. And the policy uh, work sessions, which I certainly encourage folks to uh, tune into. Um, so, if you have questions, Sean, Moira, Pat, do you have anything to add to the safety plan? And no, Dan did a good job. I just want to reiterate that um, going through and folks can take a look at the 92 page document. The purpose of the public hearing is for the community to give feedback, to ask questions, to make improvements. What we'd be voting on tonight is not an acceptance of the safety plan, would be to set the date for the public hearing. And then we would go forward from there about the safety plan. Um, and so uh, the most recent events have informed um, a good deal of the thinking. And I want to thank Dan um, for the uh, incredible work in that regard. Um, and I see that there's a question there, but I just want to put forth uh, that um, Tuesday, January 25th is a possible date for us to set the hearing. And let's see what happens after that. Um, I just yeah. have a, a brief um question comment you mentioned that you know you put something in there for students um with uh asd and you know there th that applies to students not just on the spectrum but many many students it could be sensory processing it could be a disability that doesn't even have a label and i i hope that maybe we can tweak that language and i'd be happy to help in any way that it's representative of all students who might have difficulty with these sorts of routines and whatnot. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. I probably missed a little bit of that, but um, I know that this kind of information about like this protocol and all that kind of stuff is something that a lot of students are very curious about. Um, so I'm wondering if you could send this presentation maybe to us so that we can maybe be helping the students. Um, the students. Uh, that's really helpful. Sure. Uh, um, is there a form where we could come and talk just to students? Um, Watching a board meeting, if, even if we send it out, I'm wondering if they would. We, we would love for that comment. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can come. Instead of just sending it out, it'd be great if I could. Can y'all help us coordinate? Yeah, I could come and provide a brief presentation. You could make the eye test the next video. I could, yeah, I yeah. could also make the eye oh, test. Yeah, yeah, I could make the video. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do I need that? <laughs> you gotta get those radio, <laughs> radio, <laughs> radio, radio, radio. No, actually, that's a great that's a great idea because I, I did want to provide a put it in the minutes. Yeah. Dan Bryman and some others are gonna come do I just connect around the safety protocol. I heard murmurings of approval. I mean that was uh that was that was uh impressive. Uh, so that was good. Yeah. Um, yeah. so uh you're going to do that. Um, yes. It's, um, frankly, in, when, in policy work sessions, it's much better to talk about this than to yeah. read this 92 page. That's right. right. So yeah. I heartily encourage everyone to take part. Um, 
Sean just threw up the nut, offered a date. Yeah. So where do we go with that? Um, we have to, I mean, we set the date and then we, we advertise that it's, uh, yeah. Rob, we, have another, we have another hand from a board member still. Oh, sorry. Uh, Dan, I obviously have not read the 92 page um, report or paper. Um, would you be able to tell me if in this paper um, we define what imminent danger is in terms of when our staff contacts law enforcement? Um, we did try to we did try to define that in some ways. Um, I don't. I, Honestly, I, I might have to get back to you on that, Nicole. I don't, I don't, I don't know if we specifically defined what eminent danger was, but I, I bring that up just because, as you know, there are plenty of educators across the country that are calling the cops on children for non-dangerous um, reasons. So having that spelled out for our educators and sub and supportive staff, I think would be really helpful as we as we talk about danger and what danger means to certain folks. I, I think that's a great idea. And, and, you know, we're not approving it tonight. And I'd be happy to take a stab at that language. Um, yeah, and maybe, uh, yeah. and I, I know Sean and others, Dr. Brownwell working on the code of conduct. Yeah. Maybe we use a common definition in both documents. Okay. Um, so instead of you working on a document, Maybe we work together over the next couple of weeks to figure out what that would be defined as. Okay. Because I can see some crossover. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. That's an awesome. And I would just question. add, Nicole, one of the conversations we're having, it's difficult giving the particular circumstances of a situation, but should a building leader have to connect with someone at central office before they make that phone call or connect with a colleague? So at least there is some conversation as opposed to just making it. And yet and still there will be situations where that sort of time waits can't happen. And so, um, but we can look at the way in which the code of conduct and the safety plan can merge together. And the good thing that we can still set a public hearing and that can still be part of the development as we as we move forward. It, it, it's a real conversation we've been having on the flip side of the code of conduct. So I would make a recommendation or a motion that we try to set the public hearing on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022, the question becomes, Should um, I realize that we also have legislative advocacy committee, usually before meetings or sometimes um, curriculum, uh, but didn't know if 530 would be a good time for us to set. And if we need to extend beyond that, if we can move our committees one way or the other, or move the start of a board meeting in one direction or the other, how board members felt about that. So. My recommendation would be 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. Now, is this is calendar? That is that a motion? That's a motion. Uh, I'll second it. Second by Mara. Uh, Sean, calendar is just a calendar. Uh, time is relative, so it's whatever. We can be flexible uh, on that day um, and make sure that we spend adequate time on the public hearing. So uh, move seconded, um, unless there's any real objections to that date, let's uh, go ahead and vote on. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Aaron Croyle? Yes. Eldred Harris? Nicole LaFave? I'm sorry, yes, yes. Nicole LaFave? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Wazley? Yes. There you go. Rob, just a quick addition to our student reps. Um, it's, it's a 92 page document that's not 92 pages of text. So uh, it's not actually 92 pages of reading and having a presentation is absolutely um, fantastic, but any suggestions, recommendations, questions, critiques would be greatly appreciated um, to hear from a student perspective. Uh, this safety plan, again, we relied on it most recently and it teaches us a lot of lessons. So there's, there's some other things that we can do to make it better. So 
Um, look forward to any recommendations, again, critiques, suggestions, et cetera. I don't know, Sean, there's a lot of writing in it, if you ask me. I, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I jump I jump to different places, but uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so I appreciate that, Sean. Um, item 11.4, resolution to authorize expenditures for new board member training. Pretty, uh, all new board members must go through uh, mandatory mandated uh, by law training to serve fiscal and board governance. And uh, so that is an online uh, access and course. It costs, well, I think it's $57. But, uh, I make a motion to authorize the expenditures for Kelly Evans to complete the new school board member training. Second. Emily, please. Robin, please. Yes. Sean Axley Gravel? Yes. Aaron Croyle? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Nicole Lefebvre? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Wasler? Yes. Thanks, everyone. Um, I, I don't uh, I don't want to make executive decisions. Um, we do have committee updates on the calendar. If you wish to do updates now or just punt till uh, January, that's fine. Consensus. Punt. Oh well, Morris is punt. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, for those of us, I think it's for those of us in the room. There's a majority in the room. That's right. It. So. Uh, so well, for a few reasons, uh, for facilities and others of facilities, the, everything basically is on hold, we're waiting for Albany and SED, not a lot of updates. So we're waiting on phase two. We'd really just like to have more opportunity to, uh, to do uh, true updates instead of just saying, well, we're kind of, we're in a waiting pattern because, hey, Albany doesn't have staff either. Uh, so uh, we're hoping that, uh, but we'll, uh, we've gone through policy, I'm talking about HR a lot lately. So let's uh, let's uh, revisit uh, in January. And I want to just take a couple minutes. When I say January, we, um, we are not going to have a regular public voting meeting on December 28th, 28th right? We're not, we are not meeting, we're not meeting during winter break. Everybody needs a break, believe me. Um, and to that end, because we're kind of on hold with a variety of things, we are not going to have finance and facility work sessions next week on the 21st. It is Christmas week. Um, I think everybody, and I'm looking at administrative teams too, so everybody, uh, everybody needs to uh, get through, uh, get through, get to the break enjoy school, uh, enjoy our work, uh, but uh, we need a break. We don't need to be sitting here too late night and trying to work on facilities that we can't really do anything on because we're waiting for state debt. Um, we need to get to 2022 and uh, and and be outside. I'm gonna, when in doubt, I'm outside. But I, yeah, I do go to work every day. I am triple vaxxed and all that. Um, and I've been going, to work every day for two years. I don't stay home. So yeah, it's, and I have the privilege of doing that. Uh, others have the privilege of working from home. If that's what they want to do in the real world. I go to work and it's just something that uh, it's been healthy for me to do that. So whatever keeps everybody healthy. Um, uh, I like to be outside. I like to do stuff, go play a game, go do, do things, be with the family, enjoy the holidays. Um, we are here, meaning the school board is here. If we need to vote on anything between now and the end of the year, we can have a special voting meeting. We just need 24 hours or so. Hire Rob, go ahead, John. a quick addition just for transparency, folks who uh, can access the board docs for the Ethical City School District can look at any of our committees and read the committee minutes 
to get an idea of what we've been talking about for any one of the committees. And so it is available out there for any and all to, to take a look at. And along that line, uh, just uh, for anybody who wants to read the safety plan, where can they find it? It's attached to tonight's board agenda. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's under the, the item. Um, what's the number? Yeah. Oh, oh. sorry. That's okay. In there. Yeah. All right. Point three. Okay. Question. And it's not on the website yet. It's not been a. Well, there's no. It's not been a public hearing. It's not been adopted That's by right. the board, so it can't be on the website as of yet. Last but, the last year. Plus, right. last year is there. But in advance of the public hearing. Wouldn't it be good to have the draft for people to look at? Because otherwise, sure. don't we do that? I don't know. That's what. So do we do that. We put it. There yes, we do, oh. and it will be made available for everybody. So if there's okay. any uh, edits or to that draft, please uh, don't wait on it. Okay. We do want to get that information out. So, um, so it is rare when we just have one. One voting meeting in December, we usually crank it up a week and then to uh, next week put it in the voting meeting. But uh, Dr. Brown, do we need, we're going to be okay, right? Uh, we're here, right? We're uh, monitoring, we are providing advice and guidance as a board just because we're not meeting in person, just being we're not okay. So, all right. Um, hate to, uh, some school boards only meet once a month. Where we, they don't have work sessions, they don't do any of that stuff. So, um, anything, Moira, uh, anything you need to uh, discuss? Yeah, just check the, the accuracy of in the safety plan is in the agenda. It is. Trust. And Dr. Brown. One quick last thing before we all break uh, so many people make it possible for us to have experiences particularly in-person experience. Thank you, Emily Tracy Arm, who's just returning to our organization after being a new mother, but Emily is here tonight because of, uh, and we needed her to be here tonight, and this meeting has run seamlessly on the check-in, so thank you. We appreciate you so much. And she did accommodation. I just get up there and start talking. Everything that's done on the back end is done by Emily. So, Emily, you, you mean a lot to us. We appreciate you. Thank you. And we're happy that uh, Trisha is taking a little bit of break, and which is good, and she's uh, feeling better. And uh, because Trisha does an outstanding job trying to keep uh, me in line for, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a big job. Yeah. Uh, students, uh, kids, uh, thanks for being here tonight. It's uh, it really helped uh, the conversation and helped, uh, helped everyone. Uh, move forward a bit. So it's uh, and really thanks again to the Bill Sherman fifth graders. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As I said in the past, uh, when I was in high school, I never ever went to a school board meeting, and certainly when I was in fifth grade, uh, I never <laughs> ever would have spoken to uh, the school board. So uh, you all do things that I said I never would have done back when I was uh, a student in this district. So thank you for that. Um, Enjoy uh, this next week. Enjoy the break. Enjoy the holidays, and have have some fun. Oh, we're done, by the way.